I hate delegate Eric. <laughs> good evening, good evening, good people. This is At Ease with Sia. And La Cherise. And today is a special, long-awaited episode of At Ease. It is At Ease with Friends. So we're going to jump right into it. We're going to have small talk a little later. We're going to jump right into it. We have some amazing friends with us right now. And we want to talk about the legislation that you all have been asking about, do a deeper dive into what is going on. Uh, we're going to start with Delegate Hope, Chairman Hope. If you can give us a highlight about some of the bills that are still alive, <laughs> that still have a fighting chance, uh, we have... But wait, but wait. We're going to jump right in. But first of all, because our audience knows us very well, I just want to tell our friends that this is an opportunity to be real, authentic, honest. I know the things you're most afraid of as a political leader, transparent, <laughs> at least that's what they say. Not and the ones so we got with us today. <laughs> we got some honest ones today. <laughs> this is your opportunity to talk with people about what's really going on behind the scenes. You know, they like to say it's smoke filled rooms but we try in as much as we can to make it clear, to make it easy to understand. And so we have some great friends with us tonight, but like some real ones, some friends that are gonna be honest and open about what's been happening during this legislative session. So now we can go okay. on with the formality. So but with that, if you could say your district number and your uh, localities that you represent, but we are gonna go to, uh, uh, I was gonna say Patrick, to Chairman Hope. Uh, and, and please tell us about some of your bills. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Hope, 47th District, Arlington County. This is my sixth uh, term in office. So my 12th session in office. I'm a first time uh, guest, but long time listener. I've been waiting for an invitation to come on at ease since you started the thing. So I have so much fun here. So but we can make some news tonight, I suppose. I want to talk about a bill that didn't pass and a bill that I did pass or is passing or is going. Talk about messy. That's what we love. Do so, it. So so here, so one bill that didn't make it, which you both know about, is the Ombudsman bill. And this is to create some oversight and put a little transparency with a dash of accountability in the Department of Corrections. Our prisons have no oversight whatsoever. And they have, it's not independent. They've got their own oversight that they, anytime there's a problem, they investigate and they say, oh, lo and behold, there's no problem at all. We did our internal investigation. And, and there's, there's no oversight whatsoever. Most states have some form of oversight, but Virginia is like a blind spot when it comes to any agency looking in. And one of the great tricks from the Department of Corrections, this is sort of behind the scenes type stuff, is whenever they don't like a bill, piece of legislation, they hang a very expensive price tag on it and it freaks everyone out. And you know, it makes me question that they've got this $1.4 billion budget. They oversee the lives of 30,000 incarcerated inmates and 12,000 people in, in, the, in the corrections that are employed there. And they've got this huge blind spot that they, that they really just try to get out of stuff. And it's a, it's a ploy that they use in order to kill bills. They've done it with solitary confinement and they do it, they're doing it with the ombudsman. So, uh, so that bill did not make it unfortunately, but you know what happened today was there was an allegation, a lawsuit has been filed against the Department of Corrections. It's another week, another lawsuit that shows that they were using dogs to attack inmates. Oh my there's God. one individual, this is kind of stuff like Guantanamo, Baghdad type stuff that you use that the tactics that we have decided long ago that were unnecessary and cruel and inhumane and torturous. And so, so they're being sued. I want, I, want to I want to interrupt you briefly because this is, this is huge. So first of all, I think all of us as members, we're used to getting these emails, letters, messages from our constituents asking about people who are incarcerated and I don't know about you but I've seen a huge uptick in those correspondences since COVID began with questions about how can I get my loved one out of jail out of the corrections uh, facility because they are not safe 
as long as they are living under these conditions. So number one, you have that. But what can everyday people do? Because this is really horrific. And it's almost like that feeling when your back is up against the wall and you don't know what else you can do. And so what can people do to try and help amplify their concerns um, and or help us as we are trying to formally advocate? Well, I think it's, it's to talk to your legislator, tell them why it's important that you have some sort of oversight over the Department of Corrections. And, and so we're gonna, we're gonna look at this and, and hopefully have a work group, get all the stakeholders together, determine what exactly it costs. But I mentioned this incident of this lawsuit, this is exactly the kind of thing an ombudsman can do to prevent something like this from ever happening again. And Virginia, the Department of Corrections gets sued constantly. Last month, they had two settlements that they that they made. You got to figure when they go, something goes to the legal system. It's extremely expensive to defend, and it, there's just got to be a better way to avoid all of this malfeasance that's going on and gets and shine some shine some sunlight into it. I, okay, so I that's just, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add too, like if you've ever written a letter to, I, I can only speak for me. But my team and I read every single letter that we get, whether you have numbers beside your name or not. Uh, we read all of those letters and those letters and letters from, from family members of those that are on the inside are the ways that we find out information. So please don't think that it's a waste of time to send those letters. It is very, very informative for us so that we can know what's going on to continue to try and fight this and make the changes that Delegate Hope was after. And I want to invite every member of the General Assembly, I wanted to do it with the, the uh, Public Safety Committee, to go visit a prison, should go in there. I've gone to Red Onion, which is Virginia's Supermax prison, on a couple of occasions. I've walked through the cell blocks for mm -hmm. solitary confinement. I've talked to the inmates. That's the only way you're going to know what's happening inside our prisons. And so we should do that. We should commit to doing that as legislators when things could get back a little bit back to to normal. Do I have time to talk about the, the other bill really quickly? This one, this one is moving, thankfully. There's a thing that happens in Virginia when, when your kids get incarcerated under juvenile justice, that they force parents to pay child support to support the living conditions for them in the facility. And you know, a lot of the reaction I get from people is, that's really a thing in Virginia? Yes, it really is a thing. And you think about the people that are tending to go into these facilities tend to be very low income, uh, largely people of color, communities of color that are in there, it's about 65%. And they're forcing these families, low income normally, to help pay to incarcerate for housing their children while they're in prison. Who does that kind of thing? We don't do it in the adult system, but for some reason we find it necessary to do it in the juvenile justice system. That bill has made it all through the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's through the House, passed the House. In the Senate Judiciary Committee, they sent to finance because it has a little fist to it. But my gosh, I understand that the Department of Juvenile Justice needs to pay its bills, but they shouldn't be doing it off the backs of poor families. And so and that's a policy. Us, can you tell us that bill number once again? Um, it is, I, you know, I don't memorize my bill numbers. I'm terrible at it. It's, night, it's House Bill 1912. You know what, Patrick, you have just reminded me of how too often, quite frankly, in our commonwealth, we are steadily tripping over these egregious policies that nobody is talking about. They just happen to be there and they continue to live on. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's shameful that this is the work you have to do, but I'm glad you're here to do it. Thank you. Absolutely. And if you can stick around in case there are any questions, but uh, we'll also make sure that we tag you so that if any questions arise for you in our comments, it'll be there on Facebook. Um, I, I do want to move to uh, to Chairman Sickles because I do know that he has a time commitment, but made time to come visit at ease this evening. And he has some pretty big legislation move forward uh, through a Senate committee today. So uh, Chairman Sickles, if you could tell us your district number, where you represent and a little about your bills. And, and I wanted to ask that Chairman Sickles put on his radio voice because if you all do not know, <laughs> every time the Health, Welfare and Institutions Committee meets, Chairman Sickles will welcome Good Morning Commonwealth. He has this amazing 
talking voice that sounds like we are beginning a radio show. I just <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I just say uh, good morning, Virginia. You know, uh, yeah, we're we're the House Committee concerned about improving the health care and health uh, disposition of our of our state, our Commonwealth. Um, I'm Mark Sigel from the 43rd District, which is uh, part of Fairfax County. It's all within Fairfax County. We have about 14, maybe 15 members uh, that have a part of Fairfax County. A couple members have some precincts in Arlington or Alexandria or Loudoun County or Prince William and, and Fairfax. I'm all within Fairfax and that I border on um, the city of Alexandria and go south to Lorton from there. Anyway, uh, when I came to the General Assembly in 2004, uh, the speaker, um, Bill Howe, put me on two committees that I'm still on today, um, Health, Welfare, and Institutions, and uh, which is a clunky name. I think we should have been quick enough to change the name when we, we had the rules for this two-year session, but it's just the kind of an antiquated name. It's really Health and Human Services or Health and Social Services. And, and uh, the other one was Privileges and Elections. And and I get to serve on both of those with uh, Delegate Price here today. Uh, Rules and Elections is uh, the committee that oversees the voting and uh, campaign finance and, and uh, Delegate Price is vice chair now. I used to be the ranking Democrat on that and uh, just most recently before we, we took the majority and uh, spent many years fighting, trying to fight off really bad voter suppression kind of bills um, over the years. And the first few years I was on the um, committee, I really hated it because it, unfortunately everything is so partisan on, on privilege and elections. And then, then uh, after a few years, I've started to really like it. And, and uh, I am so happy that we've been able to open up the process and do things that I never thought would have been possible when I started, especially just basically early voting without having to have an excuse uh, why you weren't going to be in town that day or why, you, you know, it's inconvenient for many people to vote on, on Tuesday in a work week when you uh, maybe you work on a construction site out of town or many other reasons. But uh, just to have it this year, I, I got an absentee ballot um, ordered on the last day after there was a three hour line outside of my my my, um, my local satellite voting place. And Got it. Got my ballot in the bail and dropped it off at a drop box. I mean, those things were, were out of not even in in a dream that I could do that in previous in previous years. So anyway, I've been on this. It's, it's kind of rare to be on two committees for that long. And in the interim, I've been on other committees: Commerce and Labor and Agriculture Committee, and then Appropriations Committee. And I've, I've been on Appropriations for about seven years, I think, six or seven years. And uh, spent a lot of time on, on budget things now, but as far as uh, the, the legislation I'm working on this year, um, the, I think the most impactful bill could be this reinsurance bill. And what, what that's all about is lowering healthcare and insurance premiums for people who do not have an employer-based um, source of uh, the healthcare coverage. Gig workers, you know, younger people who have, who have a, work from job to job. Uh, under the federal law, if you work for a company with less than 50 employers, the employer is not required to provide health insurance. And then, um, of course, just lower income workers generally. And the Affordable Care Act has allowed people to buy insurance on the exchange that's, that's subsidized by the federal government. But even at those prices in the so-called individual market are kind of high. They're still kind of high. And during the Trump years, they cut the subsidies back. So um, uh, what reinsurance will do is take uh, when certain individuals' health care costs exceed a, uh, an attachment point or a certain level, then the insurers can get reimbursed from a separate fund for the care of those people. And the effect of that is to reduce their risk and then lower premiums for everybody else that's in the market. So it, 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 it uh, expands the states that have done this, like Maryland, they have been able to reduce their individual insurance rates 
by 34%. That's probably the maximum among the states, the 14 states that have done this so far. The average has been about 16.5 or 17% reduction in individual rates. And that's probably one reason why the realtors, Virginia, Virginia's realtors are supporting the bill. And uh, many of the, uh, the disease-oriented groups, the Cancer Society, the MS Society, et cetera. And uh, so the only issue in the bill is how you pay for it. I had a, uh, what I thought was a small fee on uh, what's called fully insured plans in Virginia. This it went over to the Senate today and they substituted out my method to pay for it with, a, uh, with, a, with general funds and uh, moved it on unanimously to, uh, to their Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee. So the bill is still That's moving huge. forward. It's huge, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. And um, I, don't, I don't think that, um, um, that we're done yet with the financing of it. I think that uh, we're, we're, we may, uh, I think that we need for stability reasons, a small broad-based fee to cover this. It all goes back to insurance companies. It's all back for them. And they, the insurance companies will be able to sell more product uh, if, if we have this reinsurance for people that have high health care costs. So it's a win-win all the way around. Uh, the federal government helps pay for it because it's in their interest to reduce the subsidies they have to pay on the, on the health bill the health care exchange. Uh, another bill uh, I'm working on is, is an administration bill. It's not that hard, but um, last year we created, I had a bill to create the Virginia- And, and, and Delegate uh, Pickles, Mr. Yes, Chairman, yes, blow me down. what does it mean? mean to have an administration bill for someone who does not know what that means? So uh, the governor will have ideas and a program that they want to enact that's that's their, uh, their administration's initiative. So they'll ask members of the General Assembly to carry bills for them and, uh, and just try to you know, get them through. Usually they'll pick the committee chairs uh, to do that, not all the time, but they'll look for people that have some kind of background in the area of that they want to make a difference in. Um, last year, one of the things that the administration wanted to do, which we did successfully, is create the Virginia Health Benefits Exchange to replace healthcare.gov. Healthcare.gov has served us pretty well since we've had Obamacare, uh, but it, it's, it's a federal program and it doesn't have the kind of flexibility that we can use to make sure that everyone who is qualified to receive Good insurance is getting it. Um, and during the Trump administration, they kept whittling away at it. They've been closing the open window period, for instance. And so there's a fee that the carriers would pay the federal government to be on healthcare.gov. So we can just take that same amount and finance it here in Virginia, which we've started to do that. So we're we're transitioning over three, about a three-year period until we have our own exchange. So this year's bill is to help that along a little bit. It's to ask the um, tax division to have some voluntary uh, questions to put on your tax returns about, um, you know, the so do you have insurance? Where is your insurance? And you know, people can use that data. Uh, social service workers, uh, social workers can see if there are benefits that people are qualified for, particularly getting routine health care that they're not getting now. So it's just a way to, we call it facilitated enrollment. It's just a way to um, help uh, people find insurance products that will fit their life. Also, since Medicaid um, benefits started below 138% of poverty, the federal poverty limit, there are a lot of low income workers that can switch from being on Medicaid to having to buy um, insurance on the exchange back and forth. This, this bill will help that transition a little bit going back and forth between Medicaid and um, subsidized insurance uh, when, that's, when that's necessary. So that, that bill is not really that controversial. I think a lot of Republicans voted against it because they just don't like Obamacare or, or for some reason, but uh, we, I think it was a bipartisan vote uh, to pass Jim that Sickles. bill. Yep. What, was, what was the bill number from the reinsurance bill? The, oh, excuse God. me, the first one you discussed. 
Guys, okay. and for everybody waiting, we're going to ask you for bill numbers because we've been asking uh, those that watch our show to stay engaged. We've shown them LIS. So we want to make sure that we're giving them the tools to be able to look it up. Oh, boy. And so well, while, while you're looking for that, so Delegate Air, we both serve on HWI under Chairman Sickles, have great laughs, but we do serious work. So some, what are some of the things that, that you heard from, uh, from some of the health care bills that we have coming through? Yeah, so I must say one that was um, particularly popular um, had to be the certification of the nurse midwives. Um, as you know, Delegate Price and I have been doing work for many sessions um, on combating the maternal mortality crisis here in the Commonwealth. Um, and this particular bill was one more measure that gives uh, the support um, to communities around, uh, particularly in our rural areas, um, that will allow mothers and babies alike to both have the level of care and support that they deserve. So that's always a favorite. You know, one that was not up this session, but I have to say I'm grateful to uh, Delegate Patrick for carrying in the, the, the past. Every time we have a vaccination bill of any measure, and he has been known for carrying them, people show up in very large numbers to make sure that they are on the record about whether they believe they should or should not have to vaccinate. And so I'm grateful that in the short session, we did not have that before us, but Chairman Sickles always handles uh, that particular bill so smoothly because it can get hot really quickly. <laughs> Yeah. And Chairman Sickles, did you um, did you get the bill number? Yeah, the uh, health reinsurance program is HB 2332. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, working on the yeah. health care access for Virginians. So good evening, Virginia, <laughs> good. with Chairman Sickles. And so quickly, we're going to turn to uh, the chairman of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, and that Ooh. is well, Delegate... Okay. The Virginia, the, the Virginia, Black. the the chairman of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. That is one de delegate Lamont Bagby. Thank you for carving out time to join us on at ease. You've been on before. You've um, been a very interesting guest to have on our show. I want to know. So it looks like he might be in a vehicle. But at the same Might time, be. he has glorious lighting. And so how, how do you accomplish glorious lighting in a car? Like you are camera ready. I need to know. Well, it's these handheld ring lights. <laughs> with a, Fair enough. With a, with a battery pack. But the battery pack just fell oh, out. Oh, wow. You're serious. <laughs> Do, do you need a moment to get your production set together? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It works. Boom. It just takes a minute. You know what? I thought you were being sarcastic. So wait a minute. I need a moment here. There is a handheld car ready ring light. I am not living my life correctly. Go ahead, Maggie. Go ahead. Battery pack and everything's you, fine. You just put it on the phone. But, but wait. <laughs> So I'm not gonna let my seatmate give you that much credit. You just put it on the phone and you turn it on. So we go. <laughs> that's all you do. <laughs> but but I will give you credit. You look good, bro. You look good. I was, I, was I mean, I know I look tired, but I'm I'm here. So in my, so in my number one bill this session. I mean, I know I I I do a little bit of work on all the all the bills that the caucus is um has on our agenda, particularly. Uh, marijuana uh, justice and expungement has been at the top of our list and we're still spending time negotiating those as well as um, the legislation that or the um, constitutional amendment that uh, Senator Locke and uh, Delegate uh, Herring are, are carrying. But my main bill for me that's caused me a lot of heartache and late nights working uh, with the Senate has been the clean car bill uh, that is for uh, legal conservation voters and auto dealers and the manufacturers and getting them all at the table um, so that we can move forward with clean cars in Virginia. And, and Mr. Chairman, what's that bill number? 1965. Would you look at that? He was ready. That was a good year. 
<laughs> but we'll we'll get to the voting right back. <laughs> oh, okay. so, so why is that <laughs> so why is that something that you felt drawn to carry and that you wanted to make sure move forward this session? Well, I like to, you know, besides what we do in the in the caucus, I like to find bills that that we are forced to make people talk. Um, and this bill is one that the auto dealers were over here, the environmentalists were over here, and the manufacturers were over here. Um, along with the energy providers, um, Dominion and APCO, and getting all of them in the same place uh, and having conversations. So is, uh, bridge building and legislating, that that is so adult of you, sir. We, we appreciate fun. that work. And I will say, Thank you so much for continuing to work on all of the bills that are on the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus agenda. It is three pages long, chock full of justice oriented bills. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so really glad to, to hear that we are continuing that work uh, in that way. Anything else you want to share yeah, with the so people? It's so much that we forget how much we're able to accomplish. I mean, really, it's so much. But not like that's what we're trying to do. You want to, okay, I was gonna say, but not only that, but I think the other piece is having to leave, is it 21, 22 African-American members of the House and the Senate, and we are not a monolith by any measure. And so trying to ensure we are aligned as we are advocating for issues of our community, that is not an easy thing to do. I mean, you think about it, I, I tell people all the time, try Try to go to dinner with like Don Scott, Louise Lucas, Marcia Price, and Jeff Bourne, and and see who runs the show. It won't be Lamont Bagby, um, but but I enjoy the fact that we are family, and we 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 argue behind closed doors, but it's always for the betterment of our people, um, and we figure out how to come together um, to push these push our agenda. Yeah, so again, Beautiful we appreciate thing. that work. If you can stick around just in case we get some questions, uh, but it does look like you might have places to go. So we we understand that as well, uh, but thank you. And so now we are going to go to our other, one of our other brothers uh, in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, Divine Nine Family, my friend, the Delegate Jeff Bourne. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing, hold on. Brad. He's hold still on. my Greek brother-in-law. I mean, it's all love, but he my hey. brat, though. Hey, <laughs> let, me get my my, brat, let, me, though. let me get myself, let me get myself together to turn my light on. Okay, they, thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> is that the flashlight on yourself? It is. No, no. You know we are about excellence. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not. Well, you know. Hello, you know. good evening, sir. Um, what's up? It's good to be back. I feel like it was just yesterday during um, special session we were here um, talking about some of the same things. Unfortunately, uh, well, you 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 want to start there? I do want to start there. I want to start. Then let's do it. Well, uh, we're still we still haven't been able to end qualified or sovereign immunity for those instances where police Shame. officers um, violate it. someone's constitutional rights. Um, I still know the difference. Uh, in, in what condensation is coming on my intelligence. And I know it's not rain. Uh, hey, can, I, can I just run that back really quickly? Yeah. Of course you would. I, yeah. Of course you would. To make sure people are hearing what my brother is saying. What are you saying? You know the difference between, I couldn't quite hear you. Well, sometimes you, you, your intelligence gets this water and this liquid coming on it. And sometimes people really think that they're convincing you that that's rain. But I know the difference between rain and what it is, so um, I'm believe it at that. There might be some, my kid, my daughter might be watching or something, so I'm not. Gonna... So I just, just want to know for I'm our loyal watch. viewers, it wasn't me this time. That's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say. Y'all right. keep thinking I'm the only one. My sis can bring it too, and just put your crown on. <laughs> put your crown on. But <laughs> sir, so so that didn't make it through. Tell us, tell us some of the 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 conversation that happened when I'm guessing the other chamber, where, where did it die? No, it died in, in uh, the subcommittee that yours truly chairs. Um, huh. Yeah. Um, so in the house? In the house. When um, it passed during special session? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, we made some changes based on all that testimony, all the uh, feedback that we got, um, but um, we were unsuccessful. Um, well, let me ask my, you this. My friends, you know, my friends, Marcus and, and Patrick were right there with me the whole time. And that, Marcus, look, I was Marcus, just going to say. Marcus, Marcus <laughs> made it as easy as it could have been to table that bill. Um, uh, and I appreciate him for that. Um, you know, the, 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 the silver lining, I guess, if there is one, is that um, what, I think the Crime Commission is going to study it. I, I have a commitment from uh, the chair of the Crime Commission uh, the chair of the courts committee that that will happen. Some suggest that that's not the right place to to study it, but it's the place that we've got. And uh, my hope is is that some of the folks who say things like, "I'm not," sh let me tell you what what this bill really does, because I'm not sure that they that that people understand, or this is well intentioned, but sounds like a process. I've ever heard it. Yeah. Um, I hope that the Crime Commission can can elevate that conversation to the underlying policies because what we're really talking about um, shouldn't scare law enforcement officers because if the good law enforcement officers that I've talked to, they want to get the bad ones out just as much as we do. Um, and, you know, we, we, we inject greater levels of accountability in every other endeavor um, that we seek to legislate. Um, transparency, accountability, those are two buzzwords almost, and they're used almost as frequently as bold. Um, um, and, but, um, well, so that's what we're trying to do. So, um, so I, I do want to make a comment and I, I just, A, only the people that say things out of their mouths on our show are responsible for the things that come out of their mouths. So that's why, mm -hmm. you know, Lasharisa and I get along really great because she don't have to take responsibility for my words and, you know, whatever. So I do want to point out, and, and I have not proven the direct correlation, but I do want to just name two things that have changed. When we were in special session, Richmond was still in the midst of an uprising across the nation, Black Lives Matter were being put over all kinds of Twitter feeds, uh, corporate commercials and everything. And as we've seen that ease back, I just wanna know, and I will look up for myself, what changed in the vote that it couldn't even get out of the subcommittee well, uh, to the committee. I think the there, was, there, there were some contextual things that, um, I think some of the uh, so for example, and, and and I don't know that he would mind that 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 I mentioned his name because he has been, been consistent from uh, special session. Um, Delegate Heretic is has has been a no and remains a no. Uh, and so when you look at the makeup of this the subcommittee, the numbers would have been four to four, right? Because you have three folks from the GOP and then you and Delegate Heretic and then you have me and Marcus and uh, Patrick and Rip Sullivan, right? So at best you're four four deadlock tie, it still doesn't pass. So um, you know, to try and try and make at least a little bit of lemonade out of lemons, um, we we try to figure out a way to get it elevated, get it to a place where um, uh, you, you could hopefully remove some of the emotion out of the issue uh, and let professionals um, study the issue and come back with some recommendations. So um, that's kind of how it broke down in the subcommittee. So Delegate Bourne, you know, the other thing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you off gear in another direction right now, because you were also carrying some significant energy legislation <laughs> session. And I just, I have to bring this up because I was quite troubled when I saw in writing this level of coverage from Dominion Energy that made it all but certain that they knew what the outcome of your legislation would be before a vote was even taken. And so I'm just curious if you could share with us a little bit about that, that energy legislation that you were carrying this session, what that would have done for our communities and our families and what the ultimate outcome turned out to be. Certainly, so uh, the first one is, is what we call the right to shop. Uh, and so about 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, consumers, customers had the right to get the renewable energy products from wherever they wanted to. Um, then, then what is now known as the proverbial kill switch was inserted where um, you can still shop for your renewable energy, um, but you got to get it from your service provider if they offer a renewable product. Well, both of our uh, 
um, utilities um, uh, uh, allow for and offer renewable products. So you are basically um, forced to get your renewable energy from either Dominion or Appalachian, depending on which service area you live in. Uh, and what this what what the first bill wanted to do was just eliminate that, and and provide customers consumers um, the ability to shop for what product is best for them. And you know when you think about it, um, families do that all the time. You know when I'm thinking about whether or not I want to be with this cell phone provider or that cell phone provider, I have options. I can I can choose um, if I want to remain sort of with my TV viewing option as being traditional a cable, right? I can do that. Or I can cut the cable and go to a Wi-Fi streaming platform for my whole house. Like that's what, if you want to buy a Ford, you can buy a Ford. If you want to buy a Chevy, can, but we let competition and market play itself out. Um, you know, our renewable energy should be no different, uh, but unfortunately it is. I mean, this is the second year, last year it passed with a reenactment clause, brought the same bill back, but in the, in the interim, um, what we did was we tried to make it more attractive to a, what, a, a broader um, group of folks in the um, Senate chamber um, by adding a requirement that these new renewable energy providers that would be entering the market provide a 10% discount on renewable energy for low and moderate income Virginians. Uh, and so um, we, um, we got it out of the House, a pretty bipartisan uh, vote. Um, got it over to the Senate, uh, and it was passed by and definitely are killed um, unanimously in the subcommittee. So um, that's the first one. The second one uh, is a little bit um, sort of nuanced. Um, it it's, deals with CCROs or customer credit reinvestment offsets, which is a tool that um, several years ago, something called the Grid Modernization Act embedded into law which allows our utility providers to offset over earnings uh, with investments in other infrastructure, right? And so Sounds when you like think about- help a certain uh, utility company <laughs> out, if you will. Well, I mean, it, it helps all of them if they avail themselves of it, right? Because what they can do is instead of, if they have a significant number of over earnings, which would then ultimately trigger either a refund for customers or a rate reduction, they can, credit investment in new infrastructure to reduce the over earnings. So therefore the, the refunds don't come. Um, it hasn't been hey, used... taking the dollars that rate payers could be earning out of their pocket. Sure. Yeah, that, no, I mean, it, it, it does two things. It does, it prevents refunds or, and it, um, it would further prevent um, rate reductions going forward. So refunds are look, sort of looking in, in the rearview mirror uh, and the rate reductions that it prevents look out the front windshield. Um, you know, and what's interesting is that, you know, one of the most significant projects for renewable energy was, was sort of pitched as um, this is going to kill that project, right? And so uh, we're talking about the offshore wind project um, in, in Hampton Roads. And um, what we heard from the SEC during committee was that the large scale product project, not the pilot project, which is ongoing now, but the big one that everybody's so excited about from a renewable energy perspective. The, the utility provider is not going to generate enough um, over earnings to be able to qualify for the CCRO. So it would have no impact on um, that project. Um, they're likely going to have to either do a um, uh, increase in the base rate or put a rate adjustment clause on people's bills. So um, those are two. Um, that one fared a little bit better in the subcommittee. It actually made it to the full committee with no recommendation. Um, but oh, it was some, okay. yeah, um, it, it was summarily sort of um, dispensed with um, during the full committee today, today's Monday. Is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, today's Monday. It is still uh, Monday. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was it was a very tortured um, sort of gymnastics type process by which we got to the place where um, you know they feel good about the idea that it's been passed by indefinitely with a letter from the chairman of that Senate Commerce and Labor Committee to the electric electricity restructuring commission 
which a good friend of mine, y'all may know him, Delegate Jones sits on. It hasn't met since 2017. So again, I come back to what I said in the beginning. I know the difference. I know that's not rain. So. But they want, uh, they want you to think that something's being done. I just, correct. you know, I want to thank you because I, I believe those are strongly two measures that is trying to add, like you said, some accountability and some transparency to the way our utility companies are doing business in the Commonwealth. But not only that, but it's really putting the consumer front and center. And so, you know, we can say a lot of things about the Senate and their relationship with those entities, but I'm not gonna be that messy tonight. I'll just thank you. Right, and, and like you said, Delegate Aaron, for me and for a lot of us, this is not about um, one company or another. This is about my neighbors, your neighbors, and folks' utilities bills, which are eating up more of our, um, more of their disposable income, um, especially at a time when we're still clawing our way out of a pandemic. Um, and folks are still really struggling, which is why um, the work that like delegate price is doing on evictions is so critical um, and, and really codifying those protections that we put in um, during reconvene, during special session in the budget. Um, but anyway, let's not, I just want to focus on two things that, that, that are moving uh, real quick. One is uh, my anti-discrimination uh, housing bill which is gonna prevent localities and their, and their plan, local land use planning commissions or entities from discriminating against any of the protected classes we have. And what's that bill number? 2046, 45. Uh, hold on one second. We'll drop the link in the comments. Uh, Amy, guys, yeah. is 20, 2046, House Bill 2046. Um, and then the other one is 2047, I believe, um, which we are working on and is still moving and we're gonna make it better. Um, as anybody who's ever been or watched uh, the House Criminal Law Subcommittee know that it can be tough slog in there sometimes on criminal justice reform. Um, but essentially what this bill is gonna do is allow the introduction of relevant evidence of a defendant's mental illness um, when they've been charged with a crime. Uh, and so, um, the, the bill came out of the House not nearly where I think I would want it and many others would want it, but um, we committed to work on it. Uh, Senator McClellan's carrying the Senate version. We've got it to a place now where I think um, after lots of work uh, with stakeholders um, that it will be a good bill uh, and closer to the original intent of when we introduced it. So those two things are moving. Um, so I'm happy about those. Awesome. Well, thank you, because every time you work on a bill, you get me involved mm. and I become in good trouble working with you. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, the, wor the work that you were doing. If you can, please stick around uh, in case there are any questions. Um, I see that there are a few questions popping up, but we have just a few more folks that we want to hear from, and then we'll take all of the questions. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, a chairman that I work very closely with, and that's the chairman of Privileges and Elections. We have Delegate Mark. Marcus Simon from up in uh, Northern Virginia, hopefully still with us. And I just have to say before he comes on board, if you all ever pay attention during the floor session, pay close attention to Delegate Simon's, Chairman Simon's Zoom background. He is the king of having a Zoom background for that moment, for that time. And he keeps us all on our toes, our toes. We never know what he is getting ready to do next. And I can't turn my video on because you guys turned it off to fix oh, my wait. face earlier. So there, you go. The there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Apparently my face looked wrong. And so, you know, you said you didn't know all of our backgrounds. You also said that all your viewers are familiar with uh, LIS. So I just threw up my LIS uh, page. As the background, so people want to awesome. reach out to me. They can. They got my contact information. There's all the bill numbers, so people can see what I'm working on. Um, I want to react to a couple, a couple things real quick. Um, Marshall, you said a little bit about it on the floor, and, and and Jeff talked a little bit about in committee, just a little bit of my role within the caucus. Um, I, I get the, as the, the sort of parliamentarian, the, the guy who makes the motions. Sometimes I don't get to. I, I don't always get to make the motions I want to. Sometimes I have to make the motion that needs to be made at the time. Uh, we saw a little bit of that with the, the right to work uh, you know, 
thing that happened on the floor and how that went down. And I had to be the one to sort of bat that down. And with Jeff's bill, you know, again, counting the heads and so forth, um, I appreciate his, his, his uh, appreciation of the, the gentleness with which we had to sort of put that bill down. Uh, I feel a little bit like the, uh, the doctor sometimes is the one who's always getting pushed out. You go tell them, um, you know, I have bad news for you, but the patient didn't make it, right? The patient being sometimes our bills. On the other hand, I also get to tell a lot of Republican bills. I do enjoy that. And, and unlike Delegate Sickles, who hated P&E for being such a partisan uh, committee, I love chairing P&E. I think it's just a good fit for me because I am. I think you enjoy it way too much, Delegate too Simon. Much. <laughs> you, you are my brother in the petty, and I, and I do love it. <laughs> so uh, I'm working on, on a couple of uh, issues. So I represent Falls Church in Fairfax County, Falls Church City, Fairfax County, up in Northern Virginia, 53rd House District. Uh, been a member for about it was my eighth or ninth, eighth session, I guess. Uh, so it's been a while. It feels like just yesterday. Um, working on some bills. All five of them are still alive just because they, maybe they're scared of me, right? Maybe they don't want my, my bills to die before their bills make it through since they know my job and my role in the caucus. I don't know. But because uh, because nothing's died, but nothing much has moved forward either in the Senate, right? It's just kind of you know, along. It sounds like you just summed up the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, so we've got uh, House Bill 1951, which is on the first on my list. Actually, this abolishes the common law crime of suicide, right? So in Virginia, we don't have a we don't have a code section that says suicide's a crime, but under we, we do bring in all of British common law in, in section one of our code. And so at, at the at the common law, right, traditionally. Suicide or self-harm has been, been a criminal act. Uh, and so I'm working with some advocates uh, for, for people in the mental health uh, community, some people who are uh, survivors of, of people who have died by suicide, uh, who want to get that fixed um, and, and take away some of the stigma uh, from suicide. And people in the mental health uh, community really feel strongly that taking that stigma away is important so that when people do have um, suicidal thoughts and ideation and so forth, they, they feel uh, comfortable coming forward and sharing their, their, their thoughts and their fears because that's how they get help and that's how you can avoid uh, suicide. It also has some really weird results in civil matters, right? So, um, I mean, unfortunately, we have a, a phenomenon where occasionally people are bullied to death, you know, on, online or at school and so forth. And we've had cases of wrongful death brought against people that perpetrate that kind of activity. And that's barred because the participant and the crime can't benefit from your crime, right? And so since suicide is considered a crime, that, that bars suits for wrongful death. And also in cases where, where doctors have prescribed medicines that can have depression as a side effect and don't properly warn their patient. Uh, again, those have been barred uh, at civil law because the, the act of suicide is a criminal act. So I think it's time to sort of clean up the code on that um, and get and that. that uh, and feels okay. really punitive, especially at a time where people are clearly going through something serious. And it's been carried a couple of years in a row by a couple other patrons and seems to die in the Senate. I'm hopeful this year, uh, part of the reason that advocates ask me to carry it is I'm an attorney and, and see, and I know this as well, because this happens that, that some of the attorneys over there get a little grumpy and when they're dealing with non-attorneys. They, they can be a little, I don't know if the word's condescending or dismissive or all of those things. That is a word. <laughs> that is a word. So that I'm, is hoping a word. That, I'm hoping that I'll fare a little bit better. I've, I've prepared, I've watched the tapes uh, from years past and listened to the lawyers' questions and so forth. So hopefully we'll go in there prepared to, to deal with whatever issues they bring up on that. Um, campaign finance is the only P&E kind of bill that I'm doing, even though I'm chair of P&E. Uh, and we've got a bill to prohibit personal use. You know, um, somebody was saying, uh, I think it was Patrick, who was talking about the, uh, the bill um, where we charge kids' parents to keep their kids in jail. <laughs> If you're like, you really do that? Well, so we, this is one where this is a bill I introduce all the time that says you got to prohibit the personal use of campaign funds. And people look at me like, that's not already illegal. Like, there's no law that already says you can't just spend your campaign funds on yourself. The that make you go, oh. Right. So I've got a bill to, to finally do that. I think this is going to be the year. I've, I think I've found a simple enough approach to it. And I'm, I'm trying to be really careful. This is the other problem I have um, and had, particularly in the minority would be that um, I'd shoot my mouth off sometime. You know, I, we need to get this bill because this delegate is corrupt and he's bad and he's evil. He spends money on terrible things. And then I was surprised when that delegate would try and kill my bill, right? I mean, go figure. So we're trying to, to, to make this more of a, this is a system problem. We all want to deal with this. Nobody really meant to, 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 to 
create this loophole for personal use. We're going to try and just close the loophole. Hopefully, so he's a bad person. Watching wink, it. wink, <laughs> wink. <Right? laughs> so, hope we can do it that way. Uh, I've got uh, a really easy bill on electronic notaries, uh, but it's important, right? In the pandemic, we've, we've seen a lot of people moving to Zoom transactions and real estate transactions and legal transactions that involve a notary. Virginia was one of the first states to actually adopt an electronic notary statute back in 2011. The problem is that 2021 technology is a lot different than 2011 technology. So one of the, you know, yeah, we were first. Uh, bad news is, well, we were first. And so we've learned a lot over the last 10 years. So this bill brings, just brings our code up to date with the current practice. That one's actually been sailing through. Everybody seems to get why we need to do that. And that's important. Um, last one I'll talk about is uh, a bill on ghost guns. And surprisingly, uh, this runs into some trouble in the Senate too. Hopefully we can overcome that this year. And if you guys want to advocate for one, but um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've actually made some great strides. You know, Mark talks about all the things we did, Delegate Sickles, on, on voting, which are great things. We've also done a lot um, that we didn't think we'd ever be able to do in Virginia on gun safety, right? We've got universal background checks. We've closed the gun show loophole. Um, we've you know, made localities the power to where you can carry guns and where you can't, Delegate Price, right? She's shaking her head. That was my bill. Um, we've done all kinds of great things. And um, th there's a loophole, though, and I'm worried because we've, like, we've seen in places like California and other states that have been ahead of us on, on gun violence prevention. The workaround that people find is they create, they, they get these build them at home, build it yourself at home gun kits. And you buy the gun with the receiver. The receiver is the part where that holds the chamber and where the bullet comes out of and all that. You buy it 80% 80, 80 finished, right? So it's not really a gun yet, but here's a special set of drill bits and a drill and a kit. So all you have to do is follow these simple instructions and you can finish the 80% receiver yourself. You can do the last 20% yourself in probably a little bit of an afternoon in your garage. And now you've got a fully functioning firearm with no serial number, no background check, no age restrictions, right? The, the, problem, the problem I've had with these is that with this bill is I, they're all out of stock. Every time I go online to find one, they're all sold out. So people are buying these. I went to my 15 year old son get on the internet and buy one. We're going to put it together in the garage, do a video of the whole thing and, and show everybody how easy this is. Uh, it's not the law that's preventing us from doing that, frankly. It's just a supply and demand thing. So um, we're going to try and outlaw that. New Jersey, New York, a couple other states have caught on to this problem. And you know, that's a silly loophole to say, well, it's not really a gun yet, uh, but here, here's the, you know, the five steps you need to take to make it one. So we'll try and get rid of those ghost guns. Yeah, that's a little scary. I'm sitting here okay. listening to you describe the process in absolute amazement that this is a thing and that we don't have the necessary guardrails in place. Um, Chairman Simon, I'm going to be a little messy, but you're here for it. And I am going to ask you to talk a little bit about a bill that's not yours, but I heard you spoke uh, speak about it today and it was quite moving. Um, and it's actually one of those bills that on the surface, it really doesn't even seem like a big deal. It seems like a no brainer. And that is legislation that was introduced this session to move local elections to November. Um, I've heard you speak passionately about this in committee um, to members. Um, and I just, I want to amplify this conversation because you really brought to light the history of why this bill was even put in place. I've heard Delegate Bourne talk about it too, but really ultimately what this bill has done throughout the years in terms of limiting participation um, in local communities just by the very nature of having an election occur in May versus in November. Well, you know, I don't know if I want to be able to bring the passion. You guys have probably seen this happen. Sometimes it simmers, right? And it simmers and it simmers. And, you know, we sit around and we listen to people making sort of excuses for the way things are the way they are. It's really not that bad. And in my locality, they're not like that, right? And, and so, you know, and I, I, have to, I, certain, I have to listen to a certain amount of it to get the temperature up that I can really bring the heat, right? But, um, yeah, so in Virginia, we have these elections, we have local elections in May in a lot of places, in a lot of localities. And um, the loca it it's, was put there, frankly, so that, and, and people will still even admit this, although I don't think they hear themselves, right? I don't think they know they're telling on themselves, right? But they, they were put there in May when people don't really expect there to be an election. I mean, I bet you could go around and walk on the streets of some of these towns and say, did you know that you guys have elections in May for your town council and city council? 
and they, and they wouldn't know. Or if you ask, when is it? I, I don't know. Is it? I think it's June, right? I'm pretty sure we vote in, in June, and then we vote again in November, right? And they won't know um, that it's a day in May, and that's intentional. And the defenders of that say, well, we want people who are really focused in on local issues to be the ones that decide who their council is, right? We don't want people to be confused. We don't want people to, you know, who don't really understand what we're about. We want essentially the right kind of people. We don't want everybody. We just want people who really know what they're doing. And I'll tell the story that I told, I think, I think you were, so, so we, we, had a, we had a hearing on this in committee and we had 30 people signed up to speak. We had 15 people speak against the bill. And we had 15 other signed up and they were all, as it turned out, mayors or vice mayors or city council, every one of the 15. Then we had like 10 mayors and three vice mayors and two council members. And one of them told us, yeah, oh, we love it. It's great. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's nice because we can do it all in one place and we all get together. And it's like, it's like a, a a reunion, it's like a, a get together. It's like a barbecue. We all know each other, and it's a chance to get caught up and find out how everybody's kids are. And like you know, it sounds like a a big party that you need to be invited to, right? And all the folks that are the right people that know or in the know will show up at this party. And I like it reminds me of how we did voter registration in Virginia at one time, right? When the registrars lived in a house in a neighborhood, and you had to know where they lived, you had to be invited essentially to their house. It was in a neighborhood, Delegate Price, and Delegate, you might not. You know, really comfortable going to. In fact, a delegate born in delegate Bagby might not make it all the way to the front door without being asked, what are you doing here, right? And, and that's how we used to do registration. And we have got to move past that in Virginia. Um, it is time to get elections. You know, we, we've done the things to make voting easier, more accessible, absentee voting on demand, drop boxes. But we've got to do it at a time and in a place where people expect to vote. And you know, moving the May elections to November is the way to do that. Um, you know, even in the 1970s, we had a sort of reform constitution. This was some of the details I dropped on the floor today. May elections were never contemplated. They, they're like, you can do your elections in November, or you can do them on the second weekend of June, or as otherwise provided. And so then they all moved as soon as they could to this weird May date to keep people from voting. So we're moving them all to November. Uh, some of the localities are coming along, kicking and screaming. Um, and, and that's just the way it's going to have to be. And, and I thank you for mentioning this bill. It's not my bill because... I, one of the great things about being, you know, I told you about the hard part about being in leadership sometimes and, the hard, and having to go and, and make motions you don't really feel or tell people the bad news about their bill, like hey, the, the decision's been made, whether it was mine or not, right? This is how it's going to go. But I love grabbing a bill like Delegate Sproul's or Senator Sproul's bill and being able to shepherd that through, right? And I had some bills that come through your committee. Sometimes they come in and they're, they're kind of, and see this scene, I know you guys have seen it. These bills come in as like these half-baked ideas. And we get to grab them as committee members and, and subcommittee chairs and committee chairs and really sort of, you know, put them together. And then I, I sometimes I forget that wasn't my bill. You know, things come out like, oh, no, that wasn't my bill, but it felt like it was. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. that yeah, but you I, definitely I was really tapped glad to see into that some happen. of that passion, though. You, you tapped into it. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. I don't think, you know, people know all the time the history that we are often at times, again, stumbling over and discovering relative to Virginia and the way we have done things. And this is another one of those measures that we are finally undoing and getting right moving forward. So thank you. For and, and that's the thing that I really, I really respect about the way that you go about chairing the committee of privileges and elections, because you do challenge this notion of that's the way we've always done it before. If it had not been for the ability to challenge that, then we wouldn't have started asking the questions, but why, how did it end up like this? And to be able to connect it to, you know, the bird era or whatever era it was where it was blatantly obvious that voter suppression was the goal. And so while I will say that did not, that not every single elected official that reached out had the same rationale. It is to the point of once you ask the people and once you ask the constituent base, the answer was resounding. I would love to be able to get it done all on the same day or wait, we had May elections, <laughs> you know, that, that sort of deal like you like you posited. And so it was a great conversation. Glad to see that bill moving forward. Yeah, and, let me say real quick, real quick, because I see this book, I want to be fair to, she's right. A number of the elected officials that reached out to me said, I am, I share your goal, right? And they got tied up around the process. And that happens sometimes and I get it, right? 
hey, listen, this isn't just how we like to do things. And I get, nobody likes to be told what to do, right? Or you're doing it wrong <laughs> and stop it. So, but, so there were many elected officials that, that shared our, our desire to get there. They just didn't like being pushed the way we were pushing them. So. And, and Chairman Simon, before you go, by popular demand, there is a request that the Sox Twitter account that we used to be able to you know, follow and track when we were in person was live and running. And we just want to know when is it returning? All right, you know, I will, I will bring back. I got to start doing the sock. You know, I was thinking about that when I was watching Senator McClellan's lunch posts, right? I'm like, Senator McClellan's lunch? Yeah, you know, like it's Simon Sock's having to be on, on Senator McClellan's lunch all the time. So I will, I will become a more active sock poster. Although, it's, you know, I got to be careful to get my pajama pants out of the shot now that I'm working from home sometimes. <laughs> no, no, please. No, no, at least there are pants. <laughs> That part. Most of the time. Most of the time. That part. Well, we thank you so much, Chairman uh, Simon, for oh, all wait, of your you, hard work. Real quick, I might think, but two constitutional amendments we passed today on the floor of the House that shouldn't go ah, down mentioned. Right. The, the, um, the repeal of Marshall Newman, which nobody knows what I mean. So we had a constitutional amendment that said you, uh, that a, a marriage was only between a man and a woman. We were repealing that language and replacing it with language that's an affirmative right to marry in Virginia. That passed the House and the Senate and came off that Senate the House floor. That's done. Which is a yeah, huge deal. Yeah. But wait, wait, wait. Uh, well, not it's, done, done. It, not done, done. It, Gotta come back next year after an election. There that, you go. This leg of it is done. Uh, and then felon reenfranchisement. It goes to what the Delegate Price was saying earlier about how sometimes people think, well, we've always done it. There must be a good reason. And if you go back far enough, you find out the reason wasn't really that good. And that's <laughs> the felon disenfranchise them with, with, you know, you start to read the Carter Glass quote. So it's completely, you know, racist basis for that uh and so i'm glad to see that we're working on getting that fixed awesome well thank you thank you and good. uh we have heard from quite a few gentlemen uh we will have a part two where some of our women legislators uh will be available but we have some amazing women that are are with us. And so I want to bring them both on at the same time. We have Alexis Rogers with Care in Action and Tram Nguyen with New Virginia Majority. Ladies, it is nine o'clock on a Monday that felt like three days long. <laughs> and y'all are with us on At Ease. And I think we might have like four people still watching. We're still going to get, oh, 13. We're going to get to your questions. But what I do know is to keep going because folks watch this uh, later yes, in, the, in the, uh, the day tonight or tomorrow, like the, the views get up there. We know our so viewers now, very well. Absolutely. So now is the chance to get to the juicy, juicy. Y'all are not elected officials. So y'all can be spilling tea all over the place. But I do want you to first start before we I feel get like to I need your... to listen to this part here. Hold on. <laughs> no, Mr. Chairman, you have to go. <laughs> but I, I do, I, I do. I just have to say that, like, for those who are watching, you think a lot of legislators, like, that they're on some pedestal because they're doing all these things. When in all honesty, we are working and we are doing many of these things. But these ladies and advocates like them they are grinding day in and day out. They are making us smart, helping us make sure we are prepared. They are doing the work and I cannot overstate that. And so I'm just thrilled to have them in the Zoom room with us. And also like, you all know how this goes. We sip tea and, 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 and I mean like literally because- yeah. of Ma'am, you up. spill, like you just kick over the kettle. Like, what are you talking about, Sim? But wait, before we get to tea, we do want to hear about y'all's um y'all's bills. So let's let's get the oh, business some, done. Oh, yo, let's get the business yo. done. But yes. there was no way that we were about to have an at ease with friends without advocates on this here version. So let's kick it to Alexis first, Care in Action. Tell us what you're up to. Tell us your major bills. Thank you so much, Delegate Price and Delegate Aird. We are super excited to be back for our second session as Care in Action um, to pass the rest of the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. So a lot of people following might remember, last session we passed historic wage protections for domestic workers. We were actually the first state in the entire South 
to pass any kind of protections for nannies, cleaners, and home care workers. Um, and thank you, Sammy, for being excited about that. <laughs> so nannies, cleaners, and home care workers in Virginia are now guaranteed at least a minimum wage. But y'all, that's $7.25 an hour. We're set on a path to get to $15 an hour um, over many years. But we know that there's so many more protections that domestic workers need, which is why I'm really grateful that Delegate Price, uh, Delegate Gaditis, and Senator McClellan have all worked together this session to work on the expanded Bill of Rights, which would include domestic workers in workplace uh, discrimination protections, workers' compensation, and also other health and safety standards. Um, and since y'all are quizzing us on bill numbers, let me drop them real quick. It's Senate Bill 1310, House Bill 1864, and House Bill 2032. Um, and so we want to make sure our General Assembly passes all three of these pieces of legislation to bring domestic workers into all existing um, protections for workers. Um, and then we're also really excited about a separate issue that impacts domestic workers, but also a lot of other essential workers um, so Sian Lasharis, if I can mention this also, there's a really uh, wide coalition effort to pass paid sick leave for essential workers. So y'all know right now, you can't turn on the news without seeing somebody saying, oh, look, thank you so much for my postal person, to my grocery store worker, to my restaurant delivery person for being out there on the front lines during this pandemic. Y'all, thank them with some policy. We need them to have access to paid sick leave. And right now in Virginia, that's not the case. Right now, Virginia does not require employers to give anybody paid sick leave, much less these heroes that we're lifting up during this moment. Um, and so Delegate Guzman has put forward House Bill 2137, which would offer paid sick leave, five days of paid sick leave to essential work workers. So uh, not your the policy, money, money Thank you. in their pockets. The policy where your money is. <laughs> And let's make sure that people who are putting their bodies on the lines for us get access to the healthcare and the, the policies that they need. So I just I just want to put this plug in because I think it's implied when we talk to each other. So we like to make some things explicit for the new newcomers. We are also working to make sure that people don't have to put their bodies on the line. But that is a longer fight that is not going to happen this year. So in the meantime, we're doing these things to include people into these protections. So it's a it's a short game, long game. Just didn't want it to be implied. Please continue. No, I appreciate that. And when you say we are trying to make sure, I want to really lift up the House of Delegates for putting forward this policy and passing the paid sick leave policy through the house and saying, yes, we value essential workers and we wanna make sure they have access to time off so they don't have to choose between their, their own health and safety and their paycheck, right? We know that the battle is in the Senate and this isn't just tea, y'all. This is like literally in the Washington Post quoted as Senate Democrats saying that they're not sure if they can pass paid sick leave because they feel more inclined to support the interests of business. Now, as a Democrat and as someone that represents workers' values and workers' interests, I know that business and workers' interests don't have to be on opposite sides of the aisle. Um, and that we have to pass paid sick leave so that workers and businesses can be stronger. Uh, so I'm not gonna get all the way on my soapbox because it's not after nine, I don't know, people probably trying to have dinner, have some time with their partners, et cetera. What's dinner? What's a partner? Just <laughs> Okay, Sia, you can be over here. Uh, me and everybody else here. Probably. Got you. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what I would like for y'all to take away from this call, from this little section where Alexis is speaking, is tell your senator to pass paid sick leave. I feel pretty good about where our domestic workers' bill of rights is. But if you have some time, tell them to pass that too. Um, my number one ask for you would be tell your state senator, if you live in Virginia, to pass paid sick leave for essential workers. House Bill 2137 is coming before Commerce and Labor next, but every single state center across Virginia should hear that we want this to pass um, in 2021. We can't wait. Wait, can I just point out that when, when, uh, when someone tells you to dot, 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 that means serious business. She said, call your senator. <laughs> Some of y'all watching know what that means. Just a reminder. 
Well, well, thank you, Alexis, for that. Uh, we appreciate you are sticking around for, for the next set of questions, but we are going to turn it to the uh, national star that we have with us here who is making waves that are just, I mean, when you're getting shout outs from Stacey Abrams and you're just like hobnobbing while saving voting rights, we we are yeah, just well, very grateful for your presence. Scheduled to get their vaccination shots. I mean, I mean, just all you, Delaware, you got the two thousand doses for the Crater Health District. All I did was, you know, it was snowing outside and icing. I just had to pick up the phone and call some people. I, was I just want to say excellence. I, I I am in the presence of excellence, and so so Tram, you are with New Virginia Majority, and you are working on things. Tell us some of those things. We're working on a lot of things. And so I just want to shout out to, to my new Virginia majority family and our staff that are doing, I mean, when Delegate Air talks about people and the advocates that are doing like the, the work and rolling up our sleeves, like it is, I mean, it's our members, it's our policy team. I mean, they, they are on it like every day from 6 a.m. to I don't even, I mean, they're still working right now. So um, on it, on it, on it. So I think we have too many bills for me to go over today, tonight, but I will, I'll just say that um, a couple of things, you know, we're, our organization tends to work with some of the most underrepresented folks, right, including um, our uh, undocumented immigrants, and, and I think that we have made a lot of progress uh, last year and this year, not only um, getting folks to have driver privilege cards, so they can actually get to school, to work, um, to, you know, to church and all of the activities that they need to get to. Um, In-state tuition finally passed last year. That has been like, I don't know how fucking long we've been trying to do that. <laughs> um, and so not only did in-state tuition pass last year, but this year, the, the students are getting financial aid. It's not just like you can get in-state tuition, but we're saying that if you need like financial assistance, you also qualify for financial aid, which I think is just huge. So kudos to, to the Democratic majority and the General Assembly and you all for, for supporting that. But I will say that my big, big, big bill, and Delegate Price, this is not gonna be a surprise to you, it's been our labor of love, which is the Voting Rights Act of Virginia. I mean, when I think about all of the change that has happened in Virginia over the last several years, it, is, it has been possible because more people have been able to participate, right? More people have been able to make our voices heard and to hold our elected officials accountable. And that's because we believe in democracy. And it has been challenging as Delegate Sickles and Delegate Simon said earlier, you know, getting voting rights for people in the Commonwealth of Virginia has not been easy. Just two years, well, three years ago now, math is, math is hard, 2018, in 2018, <laughs> we, were, we were 49th in the country for voting rights access, right? And then because of this democratic trifecta and because of all the work that we've all collectively done, we are now 12th. And I think we are soon gonna skyrocket to number one because that is the goal. We love democracy here. But, um, but yeah, the Voting Rights Act of Virginia, I think is, is, is just critical. Um, it, we would be the first state in the South to pass the Voting Rights Act. Um, it is the most comprehensive one in the country. Uh, I mean, when we think about voter protections and making sure that everybody has access um, to, to the ballot box, this is it. This is modeled straight after the Federal Civil Rights Act. It gives people all kinds of protection. Um, and when you think your vote has been diminished and your protected class, you have a private cause of action. It requires language access. I mean, it is just phenomenal and the work that was put into it not only delegate price your leadership for the last year on um, making sure that it got to where it is today um you know Del uh, and you know senator mcclellan county in the senate and then the national partners like i just i can't even i don't have the words to describe like i mean i i am speechless the, the senate version passed the house today the full house and so that's done. Tomorrow, Delegate Price, your bill is going to be in Senate PE &E in full committee. We're going to need people to pay attention, to, to show up, make sure we seal the deal on the House version two, House Bill 1890. And when the governor signs that bill, 
Like we are literally making history. We are literally making history. Um, and I cannot overstate enough, like, I mean, 400 years ago, 400 plus years ago, this was the first representative democracy here. And it has not been a true representative democracy. And we know that because of all of the voter suppression, Jim Crow and everything else. And we are on our way to like coming full circle. And it's, it's, it's a really powerful moment. And I just, it's such an honor to be able to be a, a small part of it um, and to work with such a team. So that's, that's the labor of love. That's the one bill that like, if I could like, <laughs> it's, use kind of of all the like deals. <laughs> it's just, yes. So, and I, I just want to thank Delegate Prize seriously for, for your leadership on that because it wouldn't have been possible without you. She deserves you. all the roses. <laughs> all the roses, all the flowers, all the things. All the things. Well, I just, I want to tell you, I, I spoke with um, press earlier today because, I mean, you guys are learning the system uh, as we're going through. So when uh, Tram says that Senate Bill 1395 passed the House, that is a Senate bill. That means that bill is on the way to the governor. So that means it's like going to become law as soon as the governor signs it. And the governor, I mean, to his credit, has had a track record of being on the right side of voting rights legislation. So I'm very, very hopeful with that, looking forward to talking with them about it. So to know that I was um, <laughs> earlier today talking about my grandparents having to pay poll taxes, about, you know, my, my great, great grandfather was an alderman. He was an elected official in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, one of the first. And then my grandpa was the first to serve on the Newport News School Board. My dad was the first African-American to be popularly elected as mayor of the city of Newport News. My uncle was the first African-American since Reconstruction to represent um, Virginia in the United States Congress. And all of that is wonderful. And it's, it's a lot of pride that I have, but y'all, it is 2021 and I'm still fighting some of the same fights that they fought before me. And so this win is so much more than just a bill for us that have been working on it. And, and I know that, you know, Trim said it, but I have to shout out the Advancement Project, the Lawyers Committee and National Defense um, Defense League because, um, you know, when you get those amazing people together, that's why the product is as good as it is. It was collaborative work. It was a shared vision. It was so much knowledge <laughs> at the table. And that's what legislation is about, to, you know, is supposed to be. It's not about political wins. Like we are doing big things to protect voters. So I just want to shout out everyone that has fought before us as well, because you can go all the way back, like, you know, Senator Yvonne Miller, you know, the first African-American woman to serve in the House and the Senate happened in my lifetime. I was alive. <laughs> I remember her like, you know, so, so <laughs> just shout out to the people that were loosening the jar, loosening the jar year after year after year to get us to this moment. And uh, I, I do hope that the Senate will act favorably on the House version because uh, I, I want to win as well because of that, that shared history. But Whatever it is, we're going to get that change. And so I just want to say thank you to that. Uh, I was not wearing the waterproof mascara. So Tram, this is your, <laughs> but it's, it's Black History Month. You know, you got people screaming Black. We just talked about it earlier. Like people screaming Black Lives Matter when it was convenient. People coming before P&E talking about this is Jim Crow, but they're not there in the trenches every day fighting for Black people. This bill though, came from women of color and the leadership of women of color in the space. And so uh, it is, is authentic and genuine. And I just wanted to uplift that. So I appreciate the sisterhood um, that led to this moment. Delegate Aird was a chief co-patron, uh, Chairman Ward, uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Ward, a chief co-patron. So I just had to, had to say that part. So thank you for indulging me. Following your leadership though, can't, under, can't overstate that. So lean in. Um, Delegate Price, I think we have arrived at the moment where we are going to dive into these questions because if you are like my viewers, you're like, okay, this was nice, but tomorrow is another day. 
Yes. Oh. And this is, this is the problem that we have. We have bill limits and we still cannot go over every bill in an hour and a half. But yes, yeah, so the first question that I want to take up um, is from Jewel. Hey, Jewel. Um, it says, once you all go to crossover and a bill that had passed in the House fails in the Senate or vice versa, what happens to that bill? It dies. When we get to the deadline uh, of all bills having had to have action, the uh, right now it's laid on the table or it's been PBI'd, it is stuck in that committee until it is voted out. So if it does not pass both chambers, that bill is dead. So there's that. Um, let's see, we saw another one. General question from Rannon. Hey. Um, and does Simon and Delegate Bourne are there. We would love to oh, have yeah, come on back up. In on some of these. And Delegate Simon, I just want to tell you that before Delegate Price gives the next question, you are receiving virtual and digital hugs for all the work you did on the legislation you talked about earlier, moving the elections from May to November. And so people are deeply grateful and appreciative all over as a result of your leadership. Awesome sauce. So does the bill submission limit help or hurt in the long run? That, whoo, that question. Cause I'm gonna tell you when they, when they killing bills, that seven sounds a little short. <laughs> what you think? <laughs> well, we got some folks that need that limit and a little bit less. Well, so, so I'm going to say this, I'm going to say the bill limit, I think this year was necessary based on the fact that when we were going into this, we thought we were going to only have the 30 days. We're newly virtual for a full house session. So I get it. Uh, but I will say that as we are uncovering and, and exposing all of the problems that this pandemic is either exacerbating or exposing, uh, it does seem like there would be more legislative proposals that would be needed. So I think it's a give and take, but, um, but I do want to just say the House has done its fair share of lifting, even with bill limits. What do y'all say? I, I agree. And, and one of the, I, for me, one of the benefits is getting to say no to a lot of bullshit that <laughs> folks be like oh can you carry this do you want to do this nah i'm i'm not using my one of my seven on some of that i'm not like i i'm with you like but yeah i'm I mean, not, not going to trade something stupid for qualified immunity or for um you know the energy bills or something like like i'm not doing that like even my constitutional education uh amendment you know to make to to remove seek to rather than um, make it affirmative rather than a, an aspirational goal to provide quality education in, in, in Virginia. Like these things are too important and we ain't got that much time left. So I think it makes you really focus in on your work product. Sometimes as legislators, we can put in a bill that's close to final, not quite there, but we think we have time to get there with only seven bills. If it's not ready for prime time, you are not going to waste one of your bill slides on hoping and praying that you might have time to get it right because not only do the members of that committee not have time for you, but there just literally isn't enough time um, to do the necessary research to help you finish your work product. So I think that the seven amount um, bill limit for a virtual session has worked well, but when we do return to in-person, I got a laundry list, so I need a little bit more than seven. Listen, <laughs> I need some space. <laughs> let watch us work right so there was one um there was one other question that i saw and it was uh what is is hey chelsea this what is this thing they call conference uh so as we were just stating a bill has to go through both chambers right well if you have two bills that are alike um they have to be identical as they pass so if the senate passes a version of a bill and there are changes or differences in the way that the house passed the bill that bill then goes into conference where negotiations start to continue now my gripes with the process those negotiations are often uh, offline not made in public and um you're not necessarily sure who the negotiator negotiators are all at the same time, right? Uh, and then when that negotiated bill comes out, you oftentimes only have a couple of minutes to look at it in order to make sure it has all of the things in it that you need. Um, 
So as we're going forward, I know that some of us have specific, specifically asked leadership for the marijuana legislation, expungement legislation. Listen, if you got a 500 page bill, I, I'm gonna need more than five minutes to know what came out of it, <laughs> you know? And so we're really asking for that time. But what is super important is that when a bill goes to conference and those conferees are, are released, those names are public, that you let them know what you want to make sure stays in the bill, gets in the bill, that sort of thing. So your advocacy does not end uh, until after the governor signs the bill. So just a yeah, reminder. I want to make a really another point about this because I love my advocates. I love my activists, but sometimes we celebrate a little too soon. And I often want to say, wait, hold up. Yes, it passed the committee. Yes, it passed the body. But did you look at the fine print? Did you see the changes that were made? Is this the direction you really want to go in? And so as advocates and as activists, sometimes you give cover to members or an entire body for acting on legislation, but ultimately they have either gutted it out, they have swapped out the language for something that is far less effective. And we have to get really wise about this process and what can happen along the way to make sure it's actually accomplishing what we set out to do and set out to accomplish. And so sometimes with these conference committees, you have bills that go in one way and come out entirely different. And we have to just keep applying the pressure to let them know we are hip to the process. We know what can happen and we are holding you accountable for what you said you would do regardless of the many phases that this legislation is going through and so it is just so critical that we get smart about that strategy and we don't give anyone uh, a win when they don't deserve one or when the bill is not yet complete because the other part of that delegate air don't forget is or we vote no <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no guarantee that I have to vote yes on a bill that doesn't do what the bill started out to do. And so there's, there's that part. So, you know, I just want to reiterate something just for the benefit. I know we've ha had a lot of, of information, but as, as far as advocacy is concerned, because you will continue to hear Black History Month speeches from members of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. You will continually hear cries from us to ask our allies to be true allies and not allies in performance or allies in hashtag only. Uh, one of those things I want to reiterate for what I said is if you mention Jim Crow, or if you mention Black people, Black voters, Black consumers, Black whatevers, because it serves a purpose for which you already had support or you were already working toward it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Confer with us because some of y'all, I promise you, I'm not going to see you at these committee meetings on qualified immunity, on driver's licenses in privileges for undocumented. Yeah, I'm not going to see y'all on this. And y'all going to be all up and through our comments on this one bill that you're that you're fighting for when we y'all got my earring falling out and we have a whole docket three page legislative agenda and we ain't heard boo from you on it understand is getting old it's getting tired and we see it for what it is jim crow and the 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 impact of Jim Crow and racism. I mean, we're trying to get racism declared a public health crisis. Show up for this other stuff. You don't get kudos for bringing up racism for something that you were already fighting for. I'm gonna leave it there because I got a little worked up. But just know, we are gonna be mad about that after Black History Month too, but especially during this good month. I need y'all to chill, chill with that. But we have Andrew, one more Andrew. minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So does, does anybody does anybody have any any last closing comments before we shut it down and we start working on part two coming at you soon? No, this is it. We've talked enough. I appreciate my friends. Good night. <laughs> okay, so you don't have control of the red button. <laughs> and we do have guests that are still um, here. I was, I was offering the opportunity. <laughs> In the absence of my seatmate's manners and any further comments, <laughs> we will say goodnight. But seriously, we want to thank all of our colleagues. We want to thank you for watching. This was way longer than we thought it was going to be. But I promise you, you learned something new. And, and I promise you. We promised you we would do it. Yes. And we did it because we love you.
and we need you to share this information. Help make sure these bill numbers get out so that we get more engagement for some of these great bills that are happening. If you have questions, drop them in the comments. We're still paying attention. Thank you to everybody that joined us. This was At Ease with Friends. We'll see y'all next time. Thank you, Delegate. Yeah. <laughs>